Lord, as we go on our day, we can help uh, remember our uh, dear friends in Israel. Father, we ask you to be your will. You watch over them and keep them in your hands today. Lord Father, watch over their country, watch over their people. We ask these things, Lord Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus.
dragging them in behind them, of course, you know. Whether they want to go or not, they're, they're dragged behind. They're going, following the case on. Marines, of course, they're part of the Navy, you know, the part that likes to play in the sandbox. The rest of us, we played in the water pool, you know. And, of course, there's the chair force. Anybody ever met anybody that came from the chair force? Donuts, coffee, chairs. Brother Bob is a Purple Heart recipient. Uh, I guess that might be the way to say that. Thank God I did not get a Purple Heart. You know, there was a, there was a lot of folks in, during the course of this war or that war or this skirmish or that skirmish, they came home with all sorts of medals and so forth. I came home with a few of participation ribbons, more or less. Uh, I did not get a purple heart, and I say thank you that I did, because the way you get one, that's you get hurt. And it's not a paper cut, it's not a skinned up knee, it's, it's hurt, it's hurt bad. Uh, and sometimes uh, the purple heart is given posthumously, which means that the person died getting the purple heart. But Bob's with us with his purple heart, we're glad to have you here, Brother Bob. Duck. Oh, is that what happened? <laughs> Didn't duck. Yeah. Didn't duck. Okay. Uh, Brother Jim was in Panama. Uh, what, what was that? He was in Noriega's banana plantation or no. <laughs> Brother Jim was in Panama uh, in the Army. Uncle Sam's case on the door rolling along. And uh, thank you, Brother Jim, for your service. <laughs> now, did I miss anybody out there? We ain't got that for you. I just want to make sure that I didn't miss somebody that I didn't know about. Uh, we do have one other type of participation. Uh, Sister Marlene, could you stand up? Now tell us how many decades the family has been involved in military service.
Well, we've, uh, you've no doubt seen and we've done a couple of things a little bit different this morning, especially with the songs and so forth, recognizing our uh, military people. And again, today is the uh, day that we recognize 100 years since the end of what was known as the Great War or World War I. Brother Randy's going to go outside in just a minute or so. Uh, he's going out to ring the bell. Uh, what is going on with that is a lot of the churches in this area have banded together, if you will. Uh, we're all going to ring our bells 11 times at 11 o'clock. It's not quite the right time, but that's okay. We figured that there will be a few folks, if we told them 11, 11, they'd get mixed up and they do the other 11, 11, 11 before or something. So we decided on 11 o'clock, and uh, if you want to either blame somebody or thank somebody, it's uh, Mayor Carolyn Riggle, who's the one who actually fought it up and got it started, got the push on it. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank her. I hope I see her at the parade today to thank her. She is a very big, big, big sponsor of veterans and veterans' causes and so forth. And uh, there's a few other things I don't like about the way she does politics, but I like that part of it. <laughs> but uh, make a long story short, we're, we're going to uh, be recognizing veterans this morning. Go ahead, Brother Randy, you can go out. And if you've noticed me up here messing around with this thing on here, I'm watching the clock. Uh, watching my clock, so when 11 o'clock comes up, uh, we're going to say, Brother Randy, go ahead and get it, and we'll, we'll join the rest of the churches Remembering the end of what was taught in schools in the 1920s and early 30s, the war to end all wars, the Great War. They didn't consider it a treaty day, they considered it an armistice day. That everybody laid the guns down, we're not going to shoot at each other anymore, we're not going to shoot each other anymore, we're going to be peaceful and quiet. We all know how that happened. <coughs> December 7, 1941, it uh, changed a little bit. Go ahead, Brother Randy. And again, part of the today's service, the little history lesson that uh, I shared with you today, it's not taught anymore in the schools. History has changed from what we learned as young people in the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and to a certain extent, some in high schools. Our country is in a serious transition. We have people who have no idea when we speak words like Constitution, Bill of Rights, things of this nature. They have no idea what it is, what it means. They haven't been taught that our country is run by three different branches of the government, that they are equal and co-equal parts, not any one is more important than the other. But uh, I just wanted to touch a little bit on those things today uh, to help us to understand that our country is in a transition. Last week, we gathered around the altar here 
We made a prayer circle and we prayed for our country. That should not be the last time we pray for our country. That should be a an everyday thing when you thank God for the pork chop or the chicken livers or whatever else. Even if you're eating liver and onions, you know, thank God for it. Uh, don't ask me to, because I ain't eating it, but you know. And when you're thanking the Lord for your food, mention our nation. Ask him to put his hand in our nation. Take it back over. There once was a time that the Lord God in heaven above was revered from coast to coast, north to south, east to west. That no longer goes on here in our nation. I'd like to see it start back up. I'd like to see your children and your grandchildren. Lori and I, unfortunately, will probably never have grandchildren. But I would like to see my nieces and great nieces, nephews and great nephews, grow up in a land that at least is similar to the one I grew up in. I'm not sure that we'll get back to the point to where you don't have to lock your doors, where we can leave the church open for people to come in and pray. I'm not sure we'll ever get all the way back there, but I'd like to see it get back to where people at least even know what our country is, what it's all about, where it came from, and where it's going to. One of the uh, friends of mine on the internet who we were talking not too long ago about so many of us in this one group we have been in the service and uh, one of the con one of the conversations was about uh, how we're glad that the war is over with for us and one of the other fellows came in and said it'll never happen again just simply because there aren't people who are willing to do what many of us were willing to do and if you're interested sometime in what some people did, just ask Bob about his experiences in Korea. And uh, bring him on real shit. He'll be more than happy to share with you. Uh, it's, war is not a nice thing. It's not a pretty thing. It's not a fun thing. Uh, it's that, uh, we allow it to because of the circumstances of men and women, boys and girls. We allow it to happen. And uh, there are some folks who would advocate that we should have an outlaw war. We ought to pass a law and say there ain't going to be no more wars. There ain't going to be no more killing. Nobody else is going to get hurt. We're all going to be peaceful, loving, kind, and caring towards each other and get along. Those snowflakes all live in their mother's basement. They have a master's degree in beetle theology or basket weaving. Uh, can't take a tool for it and saw it straight off. Can't do much of many things. But the snowflakes do have a good idea. Uh, they need to tell it to the bad guys. Us good guys already believe that war shouldn't be anymore. And we believe it wholeheartedly simply because we've been there, done that, didn't like it. But then again, bad guy attitudes uh, are nothing new. Bad guy attitudes go all the way back to the very beginning of time. Bad guy attitudes started one day when Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel came before God and both of them brought an offering unto God. When God saw the offerings, he was not as well pleased with Cain's as he was with Abel's. And we can suggest this reason, that reason, this reason, that reason. It doesn't make any difference what the reason was. God was not as pleased with Cain's offering as he was with Abel's. Instead of Cain saying, well, you know, brother, how about praying with me? How about you and I? We'll talk to God and we'll find out what I didn't do right. We'll find out what He wants me to do. And I'll understand better. And I'll be, you know, we'll, we'll get along a whole lot better. That's not what He did. This is a point in time where we see the first instance of a word that I hate. 
And I don't even like to use the word hate, Brother Andy. That's, that's a mean word. It's not a good word, hate. But I hate this particular word. It's called jealousy. Cain was jealous of the attention God gave Abel with his offering. Cain was jealous of the position he had been put in as being second place. And instead of Cain, well, you know, maybe I ain't doing something right. Dear God in heaven above, what do you want me to do? Instead of him doing that, and we don't know how he did it, whether it was a club, whether it was a stone, whether he choked him or whatever, but when the whole thing was done, said and done with, Abel was dead. Cain had lived through the first episode of jealousy. That jealousy had caused the first murder. And Cain was a murderer of his brother. You can't. There's, there, is no, there are no words that would ever justify what happened there. It wasn't that Abel was threatening his life. Abel wasn't threatening his family. It wasn't self-defense. It wasn't one-on-one -on -one combat in the Mekong Delta. <coughs> it was jealousy 101. He got a master's degree in jealousy 101. Now there are times, and I'm going to put my hand up, because there are times I have seen somebody have something. I've seen somebody do something. I've seen somebody with something I really like, and I'm just a little bit jealous of. Yeah. But again, Brother Bob, I ain't jealous of your purple heart. You keep that thing. Don't, don't, don't will it down to me. I don't want it, because if I get it, I, I got it. No, I don't want it. There are things that all of us, every one of us, somewhere along the line, we've been jealous of the other guy's car, Girlfriend. Boyfriend. Dish of spaghetti with pepperoni and salad on the side. All right, let me change that. Biscuits and gravy, fried chicken. And you got I, I can't get nobody's in. No, no, nobody's in this today. I can see this. <laughs> That's no belly food. <laughs> Somebody take her out, church. <laughs> Jealousy was what caused Cain to slay Abel, to slay Abel. Wars actually are an extension of that particular act. It is always jealousy that starts it. One country is jealous of what another country is doing. Jealous of what another country has. Jealous of what another country has been able to say and get away with. Uh, whatever it is. You know, all of this stuff with Israel. The neighboring countries are all jealous that Israel has the land that God gave them. Now we can talk about this any way we want to, about how 1948 was taken away from this person and given to that person. We can talk about all of that we want to. The simple fact of the matter is, you go back and you listen and you read in the book of Exodus about Moses. You, you read in there about Aaron. You read about Joshua. You read about what happened back there. God gave them that land and said, this is your land. Keep it. They were thrown out by the Romans in 70 AD. In 1948, they got it back. That is their land. It's not the Palestinians. It doesn't belong to Hezbollah. And doesn't belong to the ragheads. Excuse me if you don't understand that particular thought. Muslim. Islamic. Whatever you want to call them. I call them ragheads. I can remember that real easy. It doesn't belong to them. They have a story about how one of their prophets came over there on his white horse. And from... The mountain up there where the Dome of the Rock is, he flew off into space and God took him away. 
You don't want you don't want me to tell you the rest of that story because it's a lie. Muhammad's old dead bones are down there in the diamond. Right. Him and Buddha and a few others who call themselves prophets. They ain't prophets. They're just dead people. Dead people that have passed the judgment of Jesus Christ and didn't do too well. Why do you say that, Brother White? Because they all rejected Jesus Christ one way or the other. They rejected God the Father one way or the other. They rejected the Holy Spirit one way or the other. And that rejection will get you in trouble. Eternal trouble. But we go back to the thought today about war. Wars are an extension of jealousy. One country jealous of another and so forth. When we look at war from a biblical perspective, and I want to touch on that this morning, war from a biblical perspective. Most people want to go back to the wars that was fought in Israel and the wars that was fought in Palestinian and the wars that were fought back there, what we really need to do is see if there is a New Testament statement about war. And there is. A lot of people say, well, now I'm not sure about that, but if you think about it, you pray about it, you'll find out this is the correct statement about war in the New Testament. Paul was writing to Timothy and he said, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father. We come to you this morning on Armistice Day, thanking you, Father. First off, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who means so much to every one of us. Without him, we would be lost, undone on our way to a devil's hell. But we thank you, Father, for his death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you, Father, for his work on the cross. That we can come to you in his name and say, Father God, in Jesus' name, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me and make me a new creature in Christ. We thank you, Father, that we can do that. And for those that have done that here, we thank you for them, Father. Ask you, Lord, to bless each and every one, but also bless our understanding, Father, of this particular scripture here that uh, so many have wrestled with and, and truth, truthfully lost. Give us guidance and direction, Father. We give you the praise for all in Jesus' name, and they all said. Amen. As we look at that particular verse up there, there's two words that are really important to look at. The first one is provide. Anyone that will not provide, what does the word provide mean, Brother White? It means to give. It means to make available. It means to set up. It means to get ready. <clears throat> In most cases, when it comes time for dinner, mom or grandma or the aunt or whoever the female party of the house is goes in the kitchen and put something on the table. They provide food. Now sometimes that doesn't happen. In my sister's house over in uh, Marion, Indiana, when it was Bob's turn to cook, and I never did understand that taking turn thing, but they did. They, had, they took turns to cook. When it was Bob's turn to cook, the kids went to Colonel Sanders and brought back the red and white buckets. That was the way Bob cooked. But uh, Providing is putting food on the table. That's part of the provision where it says if anyone provide not for his own. There's an important statement there. It's the husband, the man, the man of the house, the leader of the house. It's his responsibility, not her responsibility, his responsibility. Unless he's not there. Now if he's not there, his responsibility in Linda's house doesn't work too good. Because the his is the fly she smacked on the wall the other day. That's all the his was there. So it's up to her to provide for her house. But if there was a, if there is a his that comes into her house, if we stand up here, do you Linda take him to be your lawfully wedded? And she says, Yeah, do. And do you take her to be your lawfully wedded? Yeah, do. Then it'll be his responsibility if Linda can kick back and say, Lordy, hallelujah. Did you like that? No. <laughs> 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 
and I had three guys I was going to never <laughs> But the scripture says that he must provide for his own. That provision is not just the food. That provision is not just the clothing. That provision is not just the transportation, although it is. And today, transportation is all kinds of important. If you got kids or if you got grandkids, there's the soccer game, there's the PTA meeting, there's the, there's the, there's the people get more miles taking their kids to go to school stuff than my mom and dad ever did drive. I mean, there was times that that old Buick station wagon stayed in the garage and almost got to the point where it wouldn't start because they didn't have to go to the place. Nowadays, parents are out running around that they have to provide that transportation for the children and the grandchildren because that's a part of the life that we've chosen to make for them. We have to provide that transportation. We have to provide as much as we can health care. Used to be, about 200 years ago, health care was, he's sick, call for the elders of the church, we're going to pray over him. That's how it was done. You went out and got some goose fat, and some charcoal, and you rub that on, and you hope that that did good. If that didn't do good, you found something else. You made them eat a little oatmeal and mustard with a little goose fat mixed in or something along those lines. <coughs> and you hope that they got well. Today, we take them to the hospital. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it is up to the man of the house, the head of the house, to make that responsibility or to take that responsibility to provide for that. But there's another thing he's also required to provide, and that is protection. Man in the house is required to provide protection. Because if he doesn't, nobody else is going to. When seconds count, the police are five minutes away. If you live in Delaware, if you live down here where I live, you call the sheriff, you can put on the coffee, wait for it to perk, pour it out, drink a cup, and go back in there and get another before the sheriff ever gets there. It's a half an hour. The fact of the matter is, when the police came down to our house some time ago, several years ago, the city police needed to come down to the 1323 Klein Road to check on some stuff. The city police didn't know what 1323 Klein Road was. They had to get the sheriff to come and get it. I, my wife, she looks out the door, there's two police cars and four policemen walking up on the porch, and she said, what has he done now? <laughs> I didn't do nothing, but, well, that's the way it goes. The important thing is protection from trouble, protection from attack, protection from harm, all falls on the shoulders of the head of the household. Linda, you need to get you a good shot from sister. So you protect your house. <coughs> she ain't that good, but whatever. The important thing is, the head of the household is required to provide that protection. Now we here in the United States today, especially if you live in town, a lot of people don't bother with it, you know. Well, we got the policeman. Sheriff lives right down the street. Ain't no big deal. Nothing happens around here. Uh, move down to 20th Avenue in Columbus, just off of Cleveland. Uh, leave your doors unlocked for a couple nights. See how well that works out for you. There won't be much left to steal after about two days. Everything will be gone. You might be gone. But that's the society that we live in today. We need to have protection. Protection can come with locks. Protection can come with uh, guns. Protection can come with... Uh, my stepdad, when we moved out on the Orange Road, had a hatchet underneath the bed. And don't you bother that. I mean, don't you bother that hatchet. He'd go over there, lay down that bed every night, you could hear him fumble down there. You'd hear it hit the, hit the floor, but he'd pick it up and make sure it was there. It was in the right position in case he needed that thing. But... Uh, he was scared because we was living out in boondocks, you know, down on Orange Road. But the important part, and, and, and the most important thing we want to talk about today, was simply that, that word protection. 
And when we look to see uh, some of the people in the scriptures who did some protection, almost had to think I was going to have to tell Gary to do this. Here we go. Well, it didn't show up. It was supposed to. In Exodus chapter 17 and verse 9, Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight, fight with Amalek. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. In many places we see where if he did not take a life himself, Joshua commanded others to do so. Joshua was a man of war. Joshua was a man that God had looked down around Moses. He had looked at Aaron. He had looked at her. He had looked at Joshua. He had looked at this one. He had looked at that one. He had looked at this other one. He said, Joshua was my man. Joshua was the man that was destined to take the reins when Moses laid them down on the east bank of Jordan River. Joshua took the reins of Israel. Joshua was the man. You want to talk about a man who caused the death of many, many people? Joshua was the man that after fighting all day, wielding a sword and a shield, making the commandments to, for the troops to do this and do that. Joshua finally got tired. He stopped and he said, Son, stand still. Moon, don't come up. We're going to fight. And for the next 23 hours and 45 minutes or so forth, the scripture says almost a whole day they fought this battle. And then when it was over and the sun started to go down, God sent rocks out of heaven. They killed more people than Joshua and his army killed in the 36 hours of battle that they had there. You say, but what? Joshua's hands were bloody. How could God use him? God could use him because the blood was righteous blood. We don't like the idea of having to kill another person. Brother Chuck, I'm here to tell you, wrong people mess in the wrong way. I ain't going to protect her and anybody else that's in that house. If they're under my roof, they're under my protection. And if somebody don't like it, well, that's too bad. Snowflake, go back to your basement and tell mom to bring dinner down to you. We have to have the idea, we have to hold on to the concept that we are responsible individuals. We are first responsible for our own selves. We're responsible for the sin that we do. We're responsible for the repentance that we do after we do the sin. The other person that I wanted to use this morning as an example of God using a man whose hands were bloody is the man David. David started out as a little shepherd boy. The first blood on his hands, we don't know for sure if it was the bear or if it was the lion, but it was one or the other. As a young boy out in the field, when the bear and the lion came to after his little flock, he took his little old club and he took his little old sling and he killed the bear. And he killed the lion. And then when it came time, he killed this fellow Goliath. Goliath said, my fingers, that's right here. You know, yeah. That's nine feet tall. That's how tall Goliath was. Anybody in here weigh 120 pounds? Don't be afraid. Anybody? Well, maybe, maybe nobody weighs that. Bob's close. Bob's close, okay. It's 150. <laughs> Goliath's shield alone. The shield weighed 120 pounds. The head of his spear weighed 5 pounds. Y'all go home today, go in, the, go in the pantry and pick up a 5 pound bag of flour, hold it out there on your hand and think about wielding a spear with a 5 pound spearhead on it. That was Goliath. 
David took that knee out with one smooth stump. Boom! Right upside the forehead. Knocked him out cold, jumped up on top of him, took his own sword, and whoa, took his head off. You say, brother, why? That's bloody. That's cruel. That's mean. He made sure the dude was dead. Goliath wasn't going to wake up after a headache and get after him and cause trouble. Goliath was dead. Barnyard was dead. David went on to Hundreds. We have been involved in the killing of hundreds. You say, Brother Dwight, how can God use a man like that? David protected his nation. David protected his family. David protected the ones he loved. And anybody who is following the Lord God like they should, they're going to do the same thing or that scripture that I put up there earlier goes down to that last word, they're going to wind up being an infidel. Anybody want to be an infidel? An infidel is something that God doesn't like, in case you didn't understand what the meaning of it is. An infidel is a person that is not on God's side. They're on the bad side. They're on the other side. And when this life is over with, they stand before Jesus Christ, you say, Brother Dwight, you're going to make fun of this. No, I'm not. I'm going to tell him, get in a down elevator. The statement, go to hell. What's going to wind up to those that are infidels? Our country, thankfully, is not in a full blown war right now. We're in a skirmish in Afghanistan. We have men over there. We have men over there that are working on trying to make sure that those people don't get stuffed together enough to be able to come back here and do another 911 or do another Pearl Harbor or something to that effect. There are folks in Afghanistan who would like to do that. There are folks in Iraq who would like to do that. There are folks in especially Iran that would love to do that. Iran has made the threat we will wipe the United States out. I have to laugh. Maybe most of you don't know what a boomer submarine is. One Ohio class boomer submarine has more devastating firepower on that one submarine out of 22 missile tubes than all of the bombs together that were dropped in World War II. No one messed with that boomer submarine. And I just had this sneaking hunch, there's two or three of them set off the coast of Iran. I may be wrong. But I just had to sneak and I said probably there are a few there. But as we look back to David and Joshua, both were veterans of the wars of Israel, veterans of combat, men who took the lives of other men in defense of their nation and their families. And we call them veterans because they were alive at the time that we read about them. The popular police statement that goes along with this is where they are tasked to protect and defend. That's what that scripture that we had up here was all about. To protect and defend. That's the nature. That's the mission. That's the job code of the veteran. To protect and defend. And uh, today as we honor a pair of God's veterans, David and Joshua, let me remind you, uh, I've already said, uh, there is a veteran parade in Delaware today. Uh, if you can, I'm sure every one of the veterans would love to see you down there and kind of wave out on that way back at you. Uh, if you get close enough, I, I, I suppose some of them might even have some candy to hand out. I'm not sure. That, that may or may not happen. But it's going to be a parade, and the parade is to honor the veterans. But uh, if you can, it would be wonderful to see you down to honor our troops. But uh, this morning, as we come to the close of the few statements that I've made this morning, the most important thing that I want to get across, the most important concept that I want to get across, is that God does expect us to do our jobs. And part of that job is to protect each other, uh, to protect our loved ones, to protect our families. 
And if it does mean taking someone else's life who is intent on taking your life, well, don't worry about it. There's plenty of biblical evidence that that's part of what's all right. If you don't like it, but it's part of what's all right. I don't know your hearts this morning. Perhaps someone here this morning has something that you would like to pray about. If you do, Sister Rosie and Sister Sandy will come up for just a minute. We're going to sing page 81 like we normally do. And uh, we're going to ask every one of you to go to stand. Perhaps someone has, again, something that they'd like to pray about. We'd like to take you by the hand and we'd like to pray with you on whatever it is. As they sing, and as we stand.
Okay, circle complete, no broken spots. Brother Bob Burr, would you lead us in prayer for our veterans? That's a little bit emotional for me right now. Okay, Almighty oh God, we thank you for the message that Patrick White gave us today. We continue to pray that you will be with the troops that are serving our, yes, our forces so far, and our loved ones. Yes, thank you, Lord, for being with me on the battle front. You yes, saved my life. Yes, my grandmother was praying for me. I'm sure her prayers yes. were answered. So many of my buddies that didn't make it. I pray that their families found peace at last with the loss of their loved one. Be with us throughout the rest of this week that we come together again next week for the, another wonderful message from the Lord. Thank you for praying and your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. Just stay stay close. We're going to have to run back our seats real quick. Anybody have anything that you'd like to share with us before we go on this missile? Anybody else have anything you want to share with us? If not, those who can, Lord, would you stand on your feet for the blessing? May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Brother Gary, you dismiss this and send him a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together and learn about the word of Father. Father, we just want to keep all the service people and their families in our prayers. Give us our own mercies as we travel home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So, I'm